Just before this episode, I want to tell you about another adventurous audio podcast series. Inside Forensic Science is back with an utterly intriguing historic murder mystery. Westminster Gazette, August 31st. Sensational mystery in Scotland. Suspicious death of an English lieutenant. A young man is dead. And from my examination, I had no doubt that it was a gunshot wound. So is it murder or a tragic accident? The thing that worries me is that this poor guy was shot in the back of the head. And why would anyone want him dead in the first place? Didn't take too long to assess that there's absolutely something rotten in the state of Denmark. Mishandled evidence, a chaotic crime scene, fraud, suspects who vanish into thin air. We've got one witness who's actually washed the blood from the deceased. This case has it all. Inside Forensic Science, The Ard Lamont Mystery, a podcast from the Levy Hume Research Centre for Forensic Science at the University of Dundee. Coming soon to wherever you get your podcasts. Right, we all good? Yeah. Are you ready, Ali? <laughs> Well, we are about to hear the final episode of Lump. So I've invited a gang of friends to join me at the Head Gardener HQ here in Inverness to listen to that final episode together and chew the fat a bit over what the series has meant to us, to them, to you, sitting around uh, with me. Everyone who's here has been touched by cancer in some way and um, has been listening to the series, so I thought it'd be interesting to just get you all together and hear your thoughts. Uh, Let me introduce you. Anna, Karen, Ali, Karen, Rohays, and Shona. And we've also got Dan, the producer, uh, wielding the mic. Now, we're here in the salon, of course, because, as you will know by now, if you've been listening to the whole series, Ali and the team at the Head Gardener have been our amazing sponsors and supporters right from the get-go it all started here in the salon a year ago i can't believe it's a year really um now you don't talk much about your breast cancer i know so we don't need to go down that direction but you wanted to support this series and i know it has resonated with you and i know you listen to it because you tell me so <laughs> is there anything in particular that has jumped out at you any any episodes or themes or thoughts i think there was two there was the one um the gift because when you've had a diagnosis then ultimately uh, you do then have a superpower because you then really don't give a shit about the small stuff anymore yeah. and actually i've got a team of 12 and so and, you know, it sounds awful, but, you know, if anything happens on the salon floor, it does make you deal with it on a day-to-day basis. From a business point of view, you deal with it on a day-to-day basis completely differently. And I know this sounds awful, but I'll just say, no one's died. Mm. You know, we can, we, we can find a solution to this, you know. So it does, it does make you deal with things on a, day, on, on a day-to-day basis completely differently. It also makes you appreciate everything so much more. And it's the, the simplest of things. I'm just back from holiday and I collected shells on the beach for Emma Jane's little girl. And, you know, would I, 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 don't, I don't know, maybe I'd have done that, but I don't know. But there's, there's the simplest of things that you take great pleasure from now that you maybe wouldn't have done before. And then the other one was, um, probably appreciating the impact it had on others. So when KJ spoke, that was, she spoke so well um, and how she dealt and and how she's still coping with Ali's Ali's diagnosis. Um, And yeah, I'm I'm very headstrong and I just just got on with it um, and didn't sort of necessarily sort of speak about it quite so openly but um i was very mindful of the impact it had on brad and on steve and you know and on on my loved ones and you know when i when i phoned my sister sue to say 
I've got to have a mastectomy. And she started crying. I just went, for fuck's sake, stop crying. You are absolutely no use to me crying. So stop it. (laughs) Now. Um, And could you please get Anton to phone Steve? Because Steve's just dropped me. I literally got my diagnosis. You're having a mastectomy. I came back to work and did a full column of clients. That's how I dealt with it. Steve went and almost had a fight with somebody in a Costa queue. Um, but, so I got Anton to phone Steve. So, you know, it was just how people dealt with the news and, and because I was just so, so that's it. This is what I've got to get on with. And I just got on with my life and got on with my day. Whereas everybody around me were falling apart. And so, yeah, the episode when you talk about how, you know, how the impact that it has on others... You don't always appreciate that yourself, just because the way I'm wired. I don't think it's just the way you're wired. I don't think when you're in the throes of of a diagnosis, you necessarily can. I I wasn't very good at flipping it over to really seat myself in, say, David and and B's shoes. Um, And the the episode you're referring to is is Kirsten Gilmore, KJ, um, whose husband, Al, has um, incurable blood cancer. If anyone hasn't heard that one, KJ does. You're right, she speaks amazingly, amazingly well. Karen, you were busy um, nodding um, while, while Ali was talking. Sorry, sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, were there particular episodes that, that resonated with you? Yeah, I think they all did because of the honesty and the, the frankness and just the just getting on with it really, you know, um, really touched me um, because, you know, there's a lot of people that, that don't want to speak about it and hopefully that'll have helped other people, you know, to be able to speak about it. Um, but the one for me was Time to Tell B. Ah, OK. I have incurable cancer um, and I'm on treatment for life, but as a mum, just to hear what you went through prior to telling her um, and how you put all the things in place to support her before you told her. You know, you spoke to teachers at school and um, friends' parents and, you know, I didn't do that. You know, it kind of hit me that I just kind of, I suppose, muddled through in a way, but you are very calm, it appears, you know, as calm as you can be in that situation, but you, you had everything in place before you thought, right, so it's time to tell me... Um, and that really just, I just thought that was really a, a super strength as a mum to be able to do that, you know, uh, having had your diagnosis and, you know, choosing the time. I, I thought it really did touch me, yeah. yeah. Let me come to other Karen. Karen, Karen G. <laughs> um, we've got daughters of, of quite similar ages. Yes. Um, and... How difficult was it for you in terms of, of well, that was talking about also it? Also, one of my favourite episodes. Um, I was diagnosed two years ago in um, March, end of March, and I had a mastectomy with Diet preconstruction, and I had to go down to Livingston for it. And I didn't tell her until a week before I had my date, so I was two months trying to hide it from her. She was twelve at the time. And we were down in Ely in Fife, um, having a lovely walk on the beach. And I just said to my husband, you'll have to tell her, I can't tell her. So they went for a wee walk and and that was it. And she came back and she went, you're going to be okay. And I went, I am going to be okay. And that was it. But that really hit home. I just thought, man, how do you tell your daughter? It's it's horrific. You know, interestingly, I wasn't going to include that episode. Um, When I wrote... um, the series because I wrote it all as a, a, a podcast first and um, I'd actually put out you know I'd, I'd, I was part way through writing the blog and putting them out there um, and someone said to me I need to know how you told B you haven't you haven't included that and I kind of paused and thought no and I think right at the beginning I was I was quite reluctant to talk about B at that point, it felt, uh, I was quite hesitant. And so I kind of had to sit and think about whether I included that. Um, And then I thought, well, I've put it out there publicly. Actually, this is probably something that 
might be really useful. And someone has said to me, it's that, you know, they've never heard people really talk about how they communicate it to their kids. So I felt it was something that was really important to put out there. But it was quite interesting because I wrote it actually a fair bit after the event. Most of the rest of it was written very much in the thick of it at the time. Whereas the Telling Bee episode, I had to walk back through it in my mind and, and think very carefully about what I wanted to, to say. Each day I feel my way forward, wondering if the words and moment will come. And they do come, quietly, calmly, at the end of a gentle Saturday spent with David and B, wandering through the town. A day so random we could have almost been playing one of our games. We nose in a couple of galleries, visit a cafe for coffee and cake. We play badminton, then buy fish and chips, which we take home to eat by the fire watching TV. When all three of us are full, curled and content, I just tell her. I tell her that in ten days' time I will have to go into hospital for an operation because there are cells growing abnormally in my left breast. I tell her that I'll have to take a few days away and then a long time recovering. I tell her, because I know she'll want to hear it from her perspective, that she's going to stay with her dad if that's what she wants while I'm away. And she absorbs all this and says, so basically you're telling me you have breast cancer? And I say yes. And she says, will you be okay? And I tell her the surgeon says I will. I ask her if she's worried, and she says she is a bit, but if I tell her it will be okay, then she believes me. And that was how, very gently, I tilted her world to align with ours. Anna. Anna. Let's bring in you. Um, any particular episodes that resonated with you? You can't have Telling Bean, you can't have the gift. last uh, <laughs> um I think there, there was obviously there was loads like I went I went through them and and yeah I was in tears and in, in some of them and laughing at others and um I think for me there was lots of little nuggets in each one that I was kind of like oh yeah yeah I remember doing that because I'm that much further down as well so it was kind of like I was almost being transported back to when I was kind of going through it and it kind of brought up all those kind of feelings but um, I was definitely in tears at the the B one. Oh. Um, the I think like the the ones where the, again it's kind of going through all of them, but it's the little jokes that you and David share, like the little dark humour, and um, like because me and my husband, it was how we got through it all, and um, I found that there's these little things that you guys would share and have a joke about, and um, like uh, I think one of the ones was the when you were first talking about your the jugs and puppies and deflated <laughs> balloon <laughs> and, and like it just kind of brought me straight back to pretty much a really similar conversation I had with one of the plastics guys when we were talking about my boobs and I'm, I'm kind of like behind the curtain and my husband's on the other side of the curtain and the plastic guys talking about how that they're they're really kind of like droopy and they're not that big um, and I'm like oh you know, I've always had really big boobs, um, and now they're being talked about as these kind of like deflated things. And deflated balloons is, is one of the ones that just went. Yeah, Poof. yeah. I remember, I remember that moment when uh, we were. Um, yes, I was behind the privacy curtain. David was the other side of it, and uh, the the breast surgeon said, "Hmm, well, they're not that big." And then the other side of the curtain, you just heard, huh, 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 huh. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, and the rest of us just said, it's a bit like having a 14-year-old boy in the corner of the room <laughs> while I'm doing a, a consultation. But anyone who knows David will know that's absolutely true to form. Um, let's come over to the other side. We've got Rohes and Shona. Shona busy shaking her head, don't want to talk. That's fine. Rohes, apart from the one that included you, um, which we, we were talking about before we started recording, um, and anything else apart from the one which you starred in, <laughs> yeah. which uh, <laughs> struck home. Um, that did strike home to me. Um, yeah, I was, uh, yeah. But I'm, I'm really interested in hearing your perspective as someone who 
has has lost someone very sadly to you know to cancer but not had it yourself um so what what resonates for you from listening well, to Lum? um i know we should mention the b1 but that was one because i have a daughter and i know that my my sister ali had a daughter as well so it did really resonate and the bit that resonated is when you got to the the game you played with B, going left and right. And I've started playing that game and we, we went to um, a city, it was like, should we go left or right? And started, and that was really nice to take away. Um, the other one that resonated, which was the one where you were talking about your cycling and the impact it had, and, and you went on a really long cycle and you were talking about the impact of that. I think I didn't just make that up, did I? You did talk about that one. I probably that was, talked... I, you know what? I probably was banging on quite a bit about cycling, in fairness, and the yeah, loss. So Moaning on about it. But it was hard mm. because, Dave, you know, your life is going out with the gang yes. and, and, you know, David was going off and you couldn't go off and it was when you got your e-bike and, the, you know, and the difference that that then could make. Back in the saddle. Mm. That Trying was episode get, back in the get, saddle. Back. Trying to keep up keep life normal but life was very not normal but for me also the episodes I've shared been able to share um, my aunt was diagnosed with breast cancer and I shared I said he I know he will listen to this and being able to do that and sadly a number of people have been diagnosed but I was be able to although I'm not going through myself I was be able to pass that on and listen to it because we had that connection and we'd been through it together and 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 that was that was huge to be able to do that um, I quite often had people get in touch and say, um, I've just had someone in my life diagnosed with cancer. Do you think it would be inappropriate for me to point them in the direction of lump? Um, and I've had that from quite a few people. And I would say... I think I asked you, didn't I send them... It, we was had a you. Convers- it was It was me. <laughs> it was me. <laughs> You're oh, not the sorry. only one, I actually. Need to, I need but, to get my yeah. patches on. Yeah. Um, it was me. Yeah, I asked you, do you think... Yeah, is this, is this so? Is it is this an okay thing to do? Yes. Would this be appropriate? Um, and I said, when well, just... there's no harm ever in mm. saying this is here for you if and when you want to listen to it. And actually, I've had a few people get in touch and say, do you think it's okay? Mm. Yeah, Karen. Yeah, I think you know, historical cancer is a very difficult thing to talk about, and to have a tool like Lump. Um, to be able to you know navigate people to I think is invaluable really and it opens the door really for that person to talk if they want to talk makes it maybe a bit easier um, for them to talk about how they're feeling because you've said how you were feeling you know and they see that actually what they're going through is normal so and you know it's not it's not just them and I think that's invaluable really yeah. Shona did you want to say anything? I'll, I'll come across to you, and if you want to sit no, there in my, silence, my we favorite, can all no, sit there in my silence. My favourite one was the B one, and as like everybody else, it's because you're a parent, and how do you relate? You know, it's it's really difficult. I mean, I could, I, I mean, when my mum was ill, it was a case of oh, I've got like a couple of months, but it might be longer, and that was the end of story. There was no, and I mean, she was fifty, you know, and it's it was like, but that was like twenty years ago. Everything's sort of come there's sort of distance and people there's do you know, a lot of people are getting better and you know you're all living proof of that but that was the hard one and the other hard one was when you uh, couldn't get the bike on the car and you went upstairs and that's not the penny I know and banging her fists and I thought that's the penny I know get it done you know because you've just you faced it and you've like this is it this is me I'm going to do this and I'm going to kick the arse out of it and you have and you've, you're living testament to this. All these people are here because of you. You know, and as you're saying, you're reaching out to people. Just where we are 30 odd years ago. <laughs> but no, it's, it's all good. I was going to tell you off because I said, you're not allowed to blow sherbet up my ass um, <laughs> because I'll get very uncomfortable. <laughs> what are you saying? Space dust. Ooh. Um, I think that episode was jealous when, when I was really frustrated. Okay. I'm surprised at Cancer's ability to still catch me off guard, even after all these months of hanging out together. I felt more angry and upset about Cancer today than I have for weeks, maybe months. The size of my capsize feels both directly in proportion and opposition to the beauty of the day, which is crisp, golden and achingly lovely. It's a day that openly defies anyone to regret being alive. 
It's a day I should be doing, being, living, breathing it all in. But for some reason I feel blocked, like I'm repeatedly throwing myself at a wall. Today I resent all this beauty. I know what the cause of all this is. I know why I'm feeling so cunty. I'm not pleased with myself for knowing it. I think it's an unappealing quality to have, which is why I'm delaying placing it here on the page. I don't want to admit it. I'm jealous. Ugly, I know. Each Saturday, when David goes off with the cycling club, I'm jealous. Today, on this perfect late November day without a breath of wind, I ache to be on the bike with him and all the others. I feel taunted, teased by the knowledge of how much the old me would have enjoyed today. I'm jealous of his freedom to do the things I used to love and I'm jealous of the club cyclists for getting to spend this exquisite day with the man I love. I hate jealousy. It's an utterly pointless waste of decent energy. It's been weird going back and listening to them, um, even though it's you know me that's obviously recorded it and written it. They still have an impact on me when I go back and listen to them. And Jealous was one of the ones that absolutely undoes me every time I yeah. I hear it. Um, for me, it was, and it was one of the most difficult ones to make public because I was really not proud of how I was behaving. I was furious with David going off cycling. Not furious, but just heartbroken. It was a beautiful day. I wanted to be out on my bike doing what I used to do. And so sad yeah. that I'd end up, you know, where I'd ended up. It, it just undid me. But to admit to all these feelings that I was feeling and how furious I was with life and just feeling fucking sorry for myself, um, I felt that the jealousy was a really ugly quality. Mm -hmm. But I think that business of honesty, you, you've got to put it out there. There's no point in, in just glossing over it. Yeah. But it was quite difficult to make that public and say, you know what, this isn't very, this is ugly. I know what's the matter with me. I'm jealous. Um, and it felt like a leap of faith. But actually it was one of the ones that got some of the most, you know, the strongest responses. And it got responses from people not who had cancer, but who had other issues that they wanted to be honest about. And it kind of set me off on a path to being slightly obsessed by honesty. Karen, you're busy nodding away no, there. No, no, I was just going to say that, you know, that is where the raw honesty is. Do you know, like, um, I'm, I'm sure that was really difficult for you, but to, for you to be able to you know, express it and put it out there and, and let people hear, that is how you feel, do you know? And as Scots people, we're not good at, you know, <laughs> telling our emotions and letting people see our emotions. So I, I think it's incredible, the honesty with your emotions that you show all the way through, um, that, you know, they're real and that's what happens, yeah. Shall we hear the final episode? Yes. I'm going to read it live this time. So this is the final ever, possibly, lump episode, and this is called And Finally. I'm sitting at the breakfast bar in the buyer kitchen. This is where I perch most days to work, the heart of our home. In daylight, I can look across to the rusty red of Alduri Castle, the other side of my beloved loch. She's become my loch over the course of the past year. Red kites often surf the thermals opposite the kitchen window. Soon the house martins will return to take up residence in the eaves, and with any luck, the ospreys will settle back on their eerie. I can hear the whirrings as David sweats out the stresses of the day on the turbo trainer. B is down in her cave watching some American horror series and calling her friends. I love the sound of her laughter. I can still remember being overwhelmed the first time I heard a chuckle as a baby. Joy at your child's joy never recedes. By my feet, Charlie and Eddie, eight-week-old Labrador pups and the latest additions to the household, are softly snoring. Across the kitchen, Gus and Henrik stare me out with their furry feline fury. 
The air is thick with the scent of a life gently moving forward, of a leaving behind. I'm leaving behind my cancer and its ripples. I'm parking them here and now. It's time. In my mind, I imagine gathering up the many words, pages and pictures of this blog, shuffling them into a straight edge, then boxing them up. I'll choose a pretty box, brightly decorated, something which indicates the contents is precious, but still a nod to the fact of its needing contained and restrained. I always suspected I'd know when to bring this part of the blog to a close. And over the past few days, I felt the moment drawing closer. And now, this evening, it suddenly presented itself. Cancer has receded. It doesn't take up centre stage. In fact, most days, it doesn't even get a bit part. My brain has softened and started to accept the twist and tightness of my body. The noise of battle has been turned down so low that, mostly, it's barely a whimper. I'm struggling to remember the last time I cried. Writing about my cancer and recovery over the past year has been an extraordinary experience. Cancer released something in me that I didn't know I had. It gave me a way to process, pick apart and sift. Through writing, I felt my way towards answers and understanding I don't think I'd have found my way to otherwise. And it gave me a way to communicate when I lost the power of speech. I've been truly touched and moved by how many friends and even strangers have got in touch to say my words have had, had an impact, which feels like a bonus because, as I've said many times, rather selfishly, this was written for me and for David and for B. But I don't want to write about cancer anymore. I'm not even sure I'll continue to write unless something nudges at me. I just want to get on with my life, and I will. So this may, or may not, be goodbye. Goodbye to a blog about cancer, for sure. But possibly the start of something much more important. Maybe a blog about life after cancer. I think that's a cause for celebration. So I raise a glass and dedicate these final few words to all of you who've helped me. Too many of you to name. But I hope you know who you are and how crazy lucky I feel to have you all in my full and fortunate post-cancer life. That's it. Last one. Done. Um, anyone got any particular thoughts on that one? Karen again. Sorry, sorry. No, and Ro Hayes. Let's come back to, to you guys while I wipe the tears up. Um, you kind of sort of answered it there. I think, like, I found creative writing when I was diagnosed. Um, I'd never written anything before. And I think it's incredible the thoughts that you do write down that, that you would never speak out really um, and the emotions that, that come out on paper that you, you wouldn't normally express um, so I think it's a, a wonderful tool for people um, to help them um, and I think you kind of did answer it really in what you said there but my question for you tonight was going to be how do you feel having done this and you know hearing it back because when you wrote it, you wrote it for yourself and, and for David and B. How do you feel now that this year has come to an end? I don't feel much at the moment about this year having come to an end because, of course, I wrote it mm, four years ago mm. now and it's been a, a, a process and then, you know, it's been a process turning it into the, the podcast. Yeah. Certainly... It's strange when I go back and listen to the episodes, um, as I, I do, because along with, with Dan, I'm involved in the production of them and obviously had to record them. I still find them really emotional, as you heard there. I find them emotional. I find all the writing very emotional. It really takes me back to the moment when I wrote it 
and I can, you know, it, it really immerses me back. And that is quite difficult, yeah. um, if I'm honest. Mm -hmm. You know, when I go and, and read the one, whether it's about telling B or Jealous or any of the others, it's quite tough mm -hmm. for me to, to listen or read them because I'm back there. I think the wonderful thing about it is, for me, it's very immersive. It takes me back there and it's always a marker in the sand. And I think, wow, look, look where I've got to now. Yeah. You know, look how far I've come. And that feels really important. But actually, I think it's really important to go back and look at these things and, and, and remember where we were and where we've got to. Um, but it doesn't make it easy. Yeah. Rohaze, you were gonna um, say something. You talked about emotions that maybe you're embarrassed about, but actually what emotions are you most proud of from going through this experience? Ooh. Ooh. Oh. That's a hard one. Oh, sorry. That's a kind of oh. nasty question I throw out at uh, someone. <laughs> oh my God. Um, ooh, what am I most proud of? I don't know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well done, guys. <laughs> 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 um, I'm not sure it's an emotion I'm most proud of, but I'm very proud of the fact that I've been so honest mm. and not been afraid to put whatever it is on the page. So um, I, that I'm proud of the fact that I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't afraid to put my emotions out there and document them for good, for bad, for anything else. I think, you know, they're all valid. Um, but I think honesty is so important. I don't think I've, I recognised before this the value of honesty. I think it's um, such a precious thing. And I don't think, I think we're very afraid of, of being really honest. But I've always asked myself, why? Why are you afraid? What's the worst thing that can happen? Yeah. <laughs> What's the worst thing that can happen? Um, you know. And so I think it's that's the bit I'm proud of. I'm, I'm a proud that I've been honest. Because there is nothing like this out there, and your honesty and bravery for doing this, I would, I would say. Because also, it I don't know. Sherbet. <laughs> yeah. Was that sherbet? Yeah, that was a sherbet. Definitely. That was it's such a personal. Sherbet. So personal. You think, oh God, do I want, you know, you want to hunker down and I can imagine, well, and then, and then to go out and share it to people and the impact you've had by that honesty and jealousy and all those can emotions. Can I just interrupt? Yes. Because you're going to hate this. I, probably. You're going to really hate it because mm. it's like a massive sherbet coming. Oh God. Mm. I'm going to brace myself. Hang and on. I, and I don't think, <laughs> I don't necessarily think that um, and you're never gonna, you, you will never acknowledge this because it's, the, because it's the person you are, but I think you need to acknowledge the number of people that you've helped by doing it, yeah. and that you wouldn't necessarily put that down. Would you put that down as an emotion? I don't know, because you wouldn't acknowledge it. It's helped, and you know, when you asked me to sponsor it, I, I said to you, you had me at hello. It was, it was just a no-brainer. Um, yeah, it was just a no-brainer. I was always going to do it. And if it, if it has helped people, and I, I really hope it has, because actually the uncomfortable bit in that is not the idea that I've helped people. The uncomfortable thing is the idea that I might have put it out there for no good reason. Because actually, um, although I'm very gobby... I wouldn't have sponsored it I, then. <laughs> you wouldn't have sponsored it. But also, it, it, it's not about ego. I, I couldn't give a toss about ego. And I couldn't give a toss about really what people think about me the thing I, I care about I, I care about them thinking god there's her banging on again just you know look at me look at me in cancer um that idea makes my toes get my toes have just curled up inside my shoes it makes my toes curl up it the only for me valid reason about putting it out there is it has to be but that says more people. about them not you mm. if it has helped people that that validates us doing it you you and me any questions or thoughts from this side? We've got Karen G and Anna. I just find the whole thing very funny. You know, I know it was your cancer journey and it was traumatic, but it just made me 
laugh. There were obviously times when, you know, it was it was emotional, but on the whole, I just thought you were a hoot, rude and honest and blunt. And obviously we met through incredible feet, the, the running, running which we have yeah. both retired from because we're old and decrepit. And our feet are not that old. incredible. We're not incredible. We're just a pair of feet now. Trying yeah. Our drinking arm's really strong. That's feet, it. But rubbish. I just, I think because you were just a little bit ahead of me in your treatment and we met through the running and I just thought it was just brilliant. A lot of people have said it's funny. Mm. Funny. And you know yes. what? I've yes. gone back and listened to it and, um, and read it and I don't think I laugh at it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I do. I, 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 yeah. <laughs> this is my worry. I have, I've read it and thought, no, I don't, I don't, that's just, that's just the way it is. It's not, it's not that funny. But people have commented that it's funny. And I've, yeah. I, to be honest, I've always found that slightly baffling. Um, but there we go. Um, that's it just, you know, when people say, well, David's really funny in it. Well, that's how he is. He says comments like that. I've not made them up. You know, um, that's, and that's the way we, we are. You know, he genuinely told his niece that I was hard to kill um, when she asked how I was. And that's, you know, a lot of people laugh. Anna, have you got any um, any thoughtlets? Um, no, I think I, I would say the same. I find it kind of heartwarming, but funny and honest, and yeah, I, it was just obviously I was kind of at a point where I felt like I'd gone through the motions of my kind of own journey and, and kind of healed and done all those things, and and then you'd brought out lump and then I so I was like oh, I'll go back and I'll listen to them and then I'm like crying one minute and giggle in the next and um, I just thought it was really cathartic it was really nice to revisit and there was things that I definitely kind of went oh yeah I felt like that and things that I was like oh no I kind of felt a bit differently but it was really nice to get that different point of view as well and um, I found it really helpful and even though I didn't think that I was in a place that I needed it. Um, That's interesting. So I think it is, it's, it's a really positive thing um, and I think the fact that you were so honest um, about it all is why it works, you know, it's why it's really good for other people to listen to. Um, because if you're not honest about these things, about how they happen, it, it would come across hollow and empty and it's not that at all. It's warm and lovely and, and yeah, definitely funny. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just one last question. What did David and B make of it? Mm. David, the whole thing started almost as, um, as a series of private letters from me to David because um, we kept my diagnosis very close to our, our, our chest and didn't want B to know so I'd write down how I was feeling and then I'd pass it across to him and he found it hugely helpful right from the get-go and was really really supportive and then he was really supportive of it being published as a blog and then he kept saying, I think this should be out there more. He's now saying, I think it should be a book. Um, so he did also say he didn't feel that he was quite the romantic hero that he'd envisaged he should be. Um, and, and could I make him... David is an awesome <laughs> character. I'm really sorry. Could, could I make him a, you know... He said, sometimes I sound like a bit of an ass. I went, well... <laughs> just writing what I'm seeing. Um, but he was, he's been hugely supportive of it. And yeah, we have a really honest and open relationship. And so being able to pass him the stuff, um, even when it's about him, he's, he's just taken it all and absorbed it. Yeah, and then in his own I'm way, just, just goes. Yeah, curious as to yeah. how, like if guys, you know, people that have heard it, and if he had been a bit of an ass, whether they jarred him, like in the pub. Yeah, heard such and such episode, a bit of a dick. <laughs> He, I mean, he hasn't but, been an arse, but he, he, was, he was amused at me writing up our less than romantic uh, proposal, uh, marriage proposal, in um, anyone who's heard that. I love uh, that. <laughs> you loved that. That was an episode when, yeah, over a piece of steak, and he, I just said, oh, I need something to look forward to, I can't look ahead, and all these kind of things. And he said, well, we could get married next year. And I said, well, we, yeah, we could. And that was it. I said, was that a proposal? He went, well, I'm not getting down on one knee. I said, was, was that it? 
He said, you said yes, that's done deal. <laughs> and I said, you know, so I wrote it as it was, but um, that was less than, than romantic. But interestingly, on that point, and I know I haven't said about B, but when we first came to recording it, and Dan, who's sitting here very quietly recording all this, um, was listening through to all of them, and he said, oh, I'll tell you what. He said, David comes out really well in this. I went, David? What? And he said, no, nah. he said, everyone's going to want a David in their life. I said, seriously? He said, yeah, be more David. That's, <laughs> that's good. Yeah, there should be a banner. Lump, be more David. And I was really surprised at him saying that. And you know what? When I went back and listened to them, I actually felt it was a love letter to David. And because he has been incredible and those who know him he is amazing he's a man of few words he doesn't say a lot but when he does he he absolutely says it as it is and he is you know he's been remarkable so I think it is a a celebration of of a relationship as much as it is anything else and it is um yeah I could very easily dedicate it to him because I think he's been just amazing every time something has just been really shit and you think it's going to go one way, he just flips it and he turns it around and he makes it better every time. He has never lacks the energy for making it better. Karen wants to come in again. Yeah, just, sorry, just very quick because it just <laughs> came back to me because I was listening to the episode um, just recently again about, you know, when you were having your, um, your operation and you'd said about, oh, I'm expecting some flowers. And David said, no, you're not ill enough to get flowers. You know, you're not sick enough. And then he comes back later on with a massive bunch of bouquet flowers. And I just thought that was beautiful. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, and when he said, you said you're not sick enough, I said, any sicker, they'll have to spell mum. <laughs> um, and that is, that, that, <laughs> that's literally what, what yeah. was on my text to him, the last thing that I said before I went into theatre. Um, you asked about B, Ali. Um, B has... Little girl, when it's all going on. She is a hormonal, my hormonal little girl, now very much in a, a teenager and in the thick of it. Um, she has listened to some of them. I don't know how many she's listened to. Her friends have listened to loads of them. Um, and so it slightly unseats her when someone she knows turns around and goes, oh, I've been listening to all of your mum's stuff. <laughs> she goes, what? So is it weird um, that like her mates think you're a bit of a rock star and does she get embarrassed by that? I don't know if she's embarrassed about it or privately swaggers about it. Yeah, it's, um, just curious but, knowing how yeah, teenage I, girls are. They, so just... I don't really know what she makes of it. Um, I recently suggested she had a writing project and I, suggest, I suggested she go and listen to Uniform to Conform. Um, and then I kind of was braced having sent it to her and went, you might find this interesting just from the sort of the structure it's written in and, and you know, trying to kind of use it as a basis for how she might write an essay. Um, and she found it really interesting. She said, oh, I remember that actually happening. Um, I remember going to try and get that, that jacket um, and you moaning at me. Um, so I think, I think it'll be interesting to see how she responds to it over the course of time, because it's there forever now. Um, it's all documented, it, it's, it's there. And I tried very, very hard to never be critical of her in it. I always tried to reflect the situation through how I was coming at it and how I was responding to her. But I hope, I really hope, she doesn't ever hear criticism in it of her. And I hope no, no one else does no. either. Because no. that, that was something no. I, I felt very, very strongly that if I was going to write about her, I could only write about my response. And actually it was really useful thinking about B forced me to really think about being in her shoes and what she was going through. And before I wrote anything, it, it actually the writing process helped me really consider our relationship, which has been difficult, you know, at times. She's been through so much with all this. Um, but the writing definitely helped that. So I don't know what B makes it's of it. It's just curious, I mean, you know, going back to when you were talking about telling B and so on, 
you know, with Brad because I got a diagnosis in 2017. Um, and then again in 2022, I think Brad said, I live each day. Right, is it going to come back in another five years? And I just, I just, I just found it interesting that, you know, as I say, you put all this preparation in place in telling B, and I just sat Brad down. I said, on a scale of one to ten, it's a two. And, you know, I said, I'm going to be fine. I'm going to be absolutely fine. And so, um, yeah, when he sort of turned around and said that I just wait for another five years and see. And, you know, it's, I just, yeah, find it quite... Um, it's been very empowering for those kids as well that have listened to it that potentially could just maybe reassure them a little bit um, that it's normal. Yeah, I think the honesty is important for them. Well, that is it. Thank you to Ali and the whole Head Gardener team. Um, you have been amazing. The support has been amazing. Thank you to Dan, my wingman here, and wingman at Adventurous Audio. He has had unflinching faith that we should um, do this. David, the romantic hero of the piece, of course, big thanks to him. And of course, B, lovely B, and all she brings to my world. Um, lastly, I want to thank all of you here tonight for joining me, but also everyone who's been in touch with me, who's listened to the podcast and has sent comments and thoughts and encouragement. I really, really appreciate it. To all of you, I just say, please keep spreading the word. Keep pointing people towards Lump if you think it will help. Sadly, you know, just about on a daily or weekly basis, we'll probably come across someone else who's touched by cancer. And hopefully, as we've, we've demonstrated tonight, it's not just a podcast for somebody who's had cancer. It's, it's for people who have lost people to cancer or have had any significant thing, I hope, happen in their lives that sent ripples through it and how you cope with that, address that, observe that. Um, I hope it will be all those things. Um, So thank you. I'll park it here and just say, um, go and have a full, fun and fortunate, hopefully lump-free life. Thank you. <laughs> We're done. We're done. <laughs> oh, that was. Oh. Oh. The series returns. That's not afraid to talk about the really dark and difficult stuff. I told each of them that their dad had taken his own life. That he was in a really, really dark, bad place, and he couldn't see a way forward and he couldn't find his way back. Stories of loss and grief. There was this sense of being on the edge of an abyss almost, you know, like, who, how am I ever going to function in the world again? Who am I? You know, what's, what's happening to me? And stories of hope after hell. Every morning that I wake up, I am grateful that I get to wake up because for a long time I didn't want to. And now the whole thing has shifted on its head. I have more happiness and joy in my life because of me. Honest, open and thought-provoking conversations about mental health. A lot of people will be told that vulnerability makes you weaker. Trust me, it makes you stronger, 100%. Speaking of suicide, a series from Mikey's Line and Adventurous Audio. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>